I started a tradition a few years ago, actually quite a few years ago, of calling either one of my sons based on when their birthday was. And on their birth date, I would tell their story of how they were born, uh, when I even started the labor pains, what hospital I took them to. And in my mind, that was in a way giving them each that special attention that children of course all need. Uh, these are adult men now, but I continue to do this. I find it is a way of expressing high value and uh, importance, but also how to impart uh, a blessing on our children and on our sons, uh, sons and daughters, regardless of age. So when my youngest son, when I was expecting him, we had just moved to a new location in South Carolina. And so on April 16th, I went into the hospital uh, getting ready to give birth to this child. Back then, we didn't know whether it was a boy or a girl. Uh, labor pains went very quickly. Randy, my husband, his father was with me. We were in the room and finally the nurse came in and said, you are progressing so quickly. We need to get you into the delivery room. Even though we've called the doctor, he has not made it, but don't worry, we're gonna call the emergency room doctor up to take care of you. And I thought, okay, that's fine. I'll do my part. And I trusted that those guys would do their part. And so here I am, Randy's with me at the head of the bed and they have me all prepped for delivery. The emergency room doctor walks in and uh, she just said to me, Mrs. Bozarth, have they given you anything for pain? And I said, no. And she said, would you like something? I said, oh yes. But I did not know that she had walked away from me and that a nurse had also walked away from me and Randy was at the head of the bed with me. So I had no idea that there was no one there. And I had these three very hard uh, labor pains and unbeknownst to me, Chad was, they called it a precipitous birth. Chad was born and he was born, but there was no one there to catch him. And he fell um, from the delivery room table down on the floor, hard tile floor in this hospital. I'm not sure how many feet, four or five feet uh, down. I didn't know it, Randy didn't know it. And at that, a few minutes later, I'm sure she turned around and, and found him and picked him up. I didn't, Randy and I knew none of this had happened. Finally, my doctor walks into the delivery room and I heard him say to her, a good catch. Really still didn't understand what that was all about. And she made some kind of off comment about, oh yeah, I got blood all over my shoes. And I, I'm still trying to figure out what's happened. Well, by that time, the nurse, brought Chad over to me. She, he was wrapped in a little blanket. He was crying. And I thought that's, that's good news. And I was so relieved that it was over and that, you know, he had his 10 fingers and his 10 toes and everything looked good. And, but the nurse did say, but Mrs. Bozarth, uh, your son fell. And I said, well, is he okay? And she said, yeah, he looks, he looks good. He looks fine. And so in my mind, because I did not realize what really had happened, I thought perhaps when they were you know, kind of cleaning him up over on the counter where they take them and uh, check their breathing and so forth. I thought maybe when they were just kind of wiping him off and cleaning him up that maybe he slipped just on the counter there. I had absolutely no idea, nor did Randy, that Chad had actually fallen that far. Uh, so they got me taken care of. I got up from the delivery room table and Randy walked with me and I walked to my room and got in bed and I was so relieved. It was over, I was exhausted. This was about, oh, 5.15, the morning of April 17th, 1984. And they sent Randy home, they said, you can go home, I fell asleep. About two hours later, uh, a nurse was in my room getting me some fresh water and I heard a baby crying and I said, is, is that my little guy out there making all that noise? And the nurse came over and kind of patted me on my shoulder. And she said, the doctor will be in to talk to you in a minute. Well, I knew at that moment I was getting ready to face a very, very difficult uh, challenge, circumstance, warfare, whatever you want to call it. And then I found out later that they had called Randy and they said, Reverend Bozarth, if you believe in infant baptism, you need to come right back to the hospital because you know, your son is dying. So when they brought him into me, Randy had gotten there. We called many, many places and many, many people for prayer, believing God for intervention. They brought Chad to us, to me, to hold. And he was like a little, 
limp rag doll. He was dying in my arms, literally. Um, they wanted us to sign some papers and we agreed, of course, to do whatever needed to be done to help him. And so first thing was they took him down for a CAT scan. And when they came back up with the results, they said that Chad had cracked his uh, cranium, his skull all the way around the back of his head. And the top portion of his cranium had actually shifted forward and he had three uh, blood clots, hematomas, pressing down on the right side of his brain. Uh, so it was a dire diagnosis for sure. And they held little hope that he would survive uh, very long at all. So then we had to sign some more papers to agree to send him to uh, a hospital because this little hospital didn't have the facilities to do kind of this kind of surgery that was needed, which was to remove these blood clots. So we signed some papers and agreed to uh, let them fly him somewhere to have the surgery. Well, it was just a very short time later they came back up and they said, he won't survive, he, won't, he, he can't live that long. So we have to do surgery here. Well, it just so happened at this hospital in this place where we lived, there was a, a famous gentleman, Muhammad Ali, that used to come to this location and he would bring his own neurologist with him, neurosurgeon. And it just so happened, I always find those happenings, those supernatural happenings. For some reason, he was in the hospital that morning of Chad's accident and they asked him and, and he agreed to do the surgery. So right there, just down downstairs, down wherever the, the surgery room was, Muhammad Ali's neurosurgeon did the surgery, removed the three blood clots, which caused his blood pressure and everything to kind of come back up to normal. And so though that was a good sign as far as living. But when they came in to talk to us, they said, yes, his vital signs have improved. We still need to life flight him to a neonatal intensive care. And so it was either going to be, you know, either uh, Charleston or Savannah. And uh, we just signed the papers, get him to wherever he needed to be to get the help he needed. But they were very concerned because there was a bruise the latest uh, CT scan showed a bruise on his brain. And they explained to us that that meant dead brain cells, which meant that he would have probably physical paralysis on one side of his body. The very least he would be drooping on one side because of his brain injury. And certainly he would have uh, mental deficits. And so that's what we were facing. And I remember sitting there and I, Randy and I of course, cried and prayed together. And I remember saying, I, I'm just not going to receive another evil report. I am going to believe each step now as they come back in to see us that there's going to be some, some semblance of a positive or a good report uh, on some level. Well, it didn't happen that way right away because the first thing that happened is they did life flight him, but they life flighted him to the wrong hospital. So my husband had driven with a friend into the hospital he was supposed to be at, and the helicopter landed at another hospital. All this time, Chad was fighting really for his life, had a seizure or two in the midst of this trans, uh, traveling in this helicopter that had really been sent over from a Marine base because this little hospital, of course, didn't have its own life flight. So by the time they got to the correct hospital, Randy was waiting and right away said, where, where is the helicopter with my son? And initially they said, we, we don't know. And then finally they landed at the right hospital and they did another uh, CT scan right away. Perhaps even an MRI, I'm not sure on that, but for sure a, C, a CT scan. And this neurologist came out to talk to my husband. I, of course, was still in the hospital. And the first thing my husband asked was, well, what, what about that bruise? on his brain. And this neurologist said, we don't see any bruise on his brain. So we knew at that moment that there had been, and that was the first good report, that we knew that healing for our son had begun. There was still a lot of unknowns to come. I was able to get out of the hospital that very next day. And, you know, Randy and I drove in there and first time we walked in to see Chad, this perfect little boy that was born without any issues, except that nobody was there to do what they were supposed to do. He was in a little cubicle. Uh, he had a little needle up his arm, up his hand, I'm sorry, one in his foot, a big patch on the side of his head. 
And I just thought, what in the world has happened and why has this happened? And Randy and I just continued to pray and believe God. And you know, for the most part, the doctors and the nurses, they were all very, you know, facilitated us, worked with us. When we'd go home at night just for a few hours sleep, I'd call first thing in the morning and there was a nurse there that always gave me a good report about Chad. I had uh, one of my baby gifts, shower gifts, was a little plaque that said, he has made all things beautiful in his time based on the scripture out of Isaiah. And so I had taken that little plaque and I had put it in Chad's little cubicle. And one morning when I called the nurse and she said, yes, he's been uh, with his little hand, he's been kind of swiping at that picture all morning. Now, whether he really was or not, but according to her, he was. And so I believe there was some connections and we just knew that in time, God was going to make all things beautiful in his time. So we went for a while, uh, seven days. I think he was in intensive care. We drove back and forth every day. Finally, the last day that we went in there, I remember I said to Randy, I'm not leaving now until they give him to me. And so we went in there and I asked the doctor and she said, no, no, this report has to come in or this report has to come in. And I remember sitting there just praying and holding him. I couldn't take him out. I had to hold him right there by his little cubicle. And I said, Lord, would you please show them who is in charge? And I didn't mean me. I meant, Lord, you show them that you are in charge of this. And honestly, within, within 45 minutes to an hour, they came back in. Oh, this report came back in. This report came back in. You can take him home today. And so I called Randy. I said, you can come get us. He said, you're kidding. I said, no, come get us. And so we put him in this little tiny uh, car seat, <laughs> this little tiny body in a car seat. And uh, I sat in the back with him, of course, just so anxious in, in my own flesh of what was going to happen because there still was no guaranteed prognosis. And little by little, little by little, we watched him develop and grow and get uh, healthier and stronger. Few little moments of some warfare, a fear that it looked like maybe his area where he had surgery, it, it had uh, gotten you know another blood clot because it was, it was red and puffy. And so I got very scared. It wasn't. And so we lived under a threat really for several years. It wasn't until he was about four or five that we began to really relax and realize that God indeed had totally completely healed him. We had taken him to a neuropsychologist for some testing. He was in second grade and the, they did many tests on him and, and one of them was a verbal skill. And when they, we got the results, he was only in second grade, but he scored 11th grade in verbal skills. But he did say if he had any concept problems at all, it would be with math. And that is certainly still true today. So I tell this story every time to Chad. I maybe leave out something or I, I remember another point and I tell him. But I just, I just like to use it as a form of verbal blessing. And really, in a way, we can say, look what the Lord has done. And so that's why I do it. But my other son doesn't have the same story, but he has his own story. And I tell his story to him every birthday too. And I use it as a way of blessing to see what God has done in their lives. Certainly in this case with Chad, the supernatural healing and deliverance. So I encourage you, those of you that are a parent, a parents, it doesn't have to be a dramatic story like Chad's. It can just be the basic story of what was going on, how soon you got to the hospital or whatever the story is. But it is remembering when they were born and then adding to that the blessing so God bless you. I hope you enjoyed this testimony of blessing, healing, deliverance. Uh, Chad is actually 38 years old now. He's doing great. He's married two children. He's married and has two children, uh, healthy, whole, and totally delivered from this uh, horrific accident at birth. So God bless you.